All right. Hello, hello. Let's just double check here. I think we're good. We are live. Um, I've got a kind of interesting setup going here today. I would appreciate if you give me a thumbs up, uh, something in the chat in the comments, if you can hear me, if everything's coming through fine. I it looks like we're live. I've got a little bit of a complex setup here focusing on the Apple TV. So uh, I threw this one up uh, here tonight. I think technically the third Techthusiasm live stream. We're going to take a look at the new uh, 2022 for, uh, Apple TV 4K. I got two of the 128 gigabyte versions. I set up my living room and I've been using it uh, for what, the last several days anyway. And I had plugged my my second one uh, into the theater here. Never had come down here yet to actually set it up or do anything with it. And I figured, well, I made the video kind of looking at some of the settings and all that, but why not? Why not do it as a hangout? Do it as a do it as a live stream. And so we can take questions about anything related to the channel, home theater, all that stuff today. And um, we can you know keep as much of the discussion focused on the Apple TV. But I do have it set up here, so I've, I've got a pretty interesting rig going. I've got my MacBook here. I'm streaming. Uh, live streaming from the MacBook, and then I've got my phone set up here on the side, connected like doubly um, with the back camera showing the screen. So if I grab the Apple TV remote and I do stuff with the UI there, we can see it, watch it live, and and do all of that. So this this device is completely fresh. It's literally been plugged in and uh, not powered, nothing of the sort. Um, yeah, so we're going completely, completely from scratch here. So um, starting to collect some folks in here. That's awesome. Um, hello to Nate. Hello to Jose. Hello to Gary. Wayne says, hi, guys. Just got my AVM 90 today. I am jealous. Sweet. Got some work to do setting that up. And a whole bunch of things to do with ARC ahead of you. Awesome. So... Pop a comment in there. Let me know you're there. Let me know where you're from. Um, if you have any questions as well to get started about the Apple TV, go ahead and drop them. Otherwise, in a minute here, I'm just going to uh, kind of start the process. And we'll, we'll talk it through, talk about the device, all that stuff as we go. I did put the, uh, I did put kind of the goofy pull up. Um, to see. So we've got at least a couple people here that were supposed to do something with their wife, but they'll be here. But not many people were bringing the bourbon. So I thought that one would get more. Got a lot of sir, yes, sir answers for people being here tonight, the military answer. So props to uh, props to any of the military folks, the veterans out there. I have a bunch of military in my extended family. I respect them very much. All right, so questions are starting to flow. All right, so let's get going here. Um, Ian says, and actually, I know how to click and have the stuff pop up tonight. I, I neglected to do that in the last live stream. So everyone is getting incrementally better here as we go. Um, have to try out the the player in the Infuse app. Always look, try out the Lily player, the Infuse app. Um, not sure what you mean exactly by Lily player, if that was a typo. Infuse, though, we can take a look at some Infuse stuff tonight. We got folks coming in from all over. Nate says, how's your day today? Pretty good day. A lot of stuff going on at work this week. Planning week, my daughter made us dinner. That was pretty sweet. She's becoming quite the chef. Any improvements on audio or audio video with the new Apple TV? Just installed mine a few hours ago. Sweet. So I think the device is snappier um, to me so far just on the LG. I can't say that anything specifically looks better or worse. Um, I haven't fired up any movies specifically down here in the theater yet on it. That that will come soon. Um, there were I've seen I've seen different things posted all over between Facebook groups and other places saying, oh yeah, the new device, something looks better, or you know, I I changed it and my wife said stuff looks better and she didn't even really, you know, care or know anything about it. Um, I think with anything, there are a lot of things in this hobby, especially new stuff. We really want it to be better, and sometimes we can convince ourselves of that. Um, I don't know that necessarily anything about the new hardware should 
tangibly impact uh, audio or video performance, so to speak. I have done a little bit of checking into like uh, some bit rates and some of the streaming apps in that, and I've not noticed any any improvements. It's not pulling any more data anyway from the providers and iTunes and such that it was before. But um, yeah, more more time will tell. I did that one. What's your must-have apps on Apple TV? We'll go through those in, um, in just a few minutes here. Uh, doing any HomeKit integrations. Um, so the one thing that I will, I can talk about a little bit about tonight uh, when we get there is the fact that Control 4 has to control an Apple TV actually through HomeKit um, and kind of hooking that up, setting that up. Um, appreciate this video from Houston. Awesome. We got folks all over. Looking forward to the video settings. Wonder why some folks are recommending RGB high. I looked into this today a little bit, and I will talk about this as well. And then the last one here. I wonder if Apple has a contract with Adobe, why they don't have DTS. Yeah, it seems like Apple definitely is more in uh, business cahoots with Adobe than DTS. So um, I'm going to launch into some setup here. I will do my best. I'm, I'm a one-man show. Um, trying to keep all of my eye on the chat so keep the chats coming if i miss one and and it seems that it's gone by um as i'm kind of looking at the screen and doing other stuff do feel free to post it again put a number two or number three or something in front of it if i miss it don't spam it but um i of course i do want to hit all the all the questions and such i would ask everybody please like the video on your way in or your way out um, and of course, uh, if, if you are so willing and you would like to support the channel directly, you should be able to do super chats. I suspect I will be able to see them um, through the connection, and I would certainly give props to them um, as they come. So one question here in Australia, middle of the workday, will this video be available for me to watch later? Yes. So pretty much universally across YouTube, when you see a channel doing a live stream, um, it's just a certain type of video. We have kind of in, in YouTube now like three formats. There's your regular video video, there's a short, and then lives are kind of getting their own uh, placement and attention and, and such. So if you go to a, any YouTube channel, now you can very clearly see standard videos, shorts, and lives. And so I've a couple that I've done so far and any others that I might do into the future here, I would certainly keep them, uh, keep them published. And so, yeah, hopefully this is a good reference for folks. Um, again, kind of doing the deep dive, the whole thing here, which is hard to do in a uh, in, in a shorter video. So that's why I thought it, it kind of fit the format. So we've plugged in the Apple TV. It is plugged in to power, of course, it's on. It's plugged into HDMI, of course, because we're getting a video signal to my display. I am sitting in my theater room, JVC NX7 up above me, uh, behind me right here. I am projecting onto my uh, see more screen, the scope screen. That's why you see some black bars there on the left and right, because we're looking at a 16.9 image on the scope screen. And I am, of course, as I would recommend um, all folks do, running wired Ethernet. Um, the device is installed in my rack. If you want to see any of those things, there are rack tour videos, there are room tour videos. All of that is on the channel. We have powered up. We are at the screen. Step one, I would like the device to communicate to me in English because that is really the only language that I know. Uh, we are in the United States. And I really hope that I don't inadvertently put out any private information as we go through these menus and stuff. Um, but let's see what happens. United States region, data and privacy. OK. So um, I, I kind of talked about this a little bit in my uh, the other video that I did, I think this is one of kind of the coolest parts of using an Apple TV or being essentially being in the Apple ecosystem, right? Having multiple Apple devices is the fact that this stuff, it all works together. Um, when you transition from device to device, or if you have an iPhone and you add an iPad or, or an Apple TV in this case, you can put these devices kind of in communication with each other and they understand you, they understand your account, they can um, authenticate each other, right, and kind of share that information between them in order to facilitate things like setup, uh, like kind of registration um, or uh, introduction, 
basically to your account. I think it's a great feature. I don't think it's security creepy in any way. Um, you know, if you're buying devices, you want them all registered to you. You want your account having kind of ownership of those devices until or unless, you know, you're, you are ready to get rid of them or sell them later. So I'm going to make sure one thing here. I'm just going to go to this view and I am going to do the setup with iPhone. Okay, nothing, nothing there. So we can see set up your Apple TV, unlock your iPhone or iPad, connect to the Wi-Fi network, turn on Bluetooth and hold the device close to the Apple TV. I am actually about a room away from where the Apple TV is and this might fail. Yeah, this might fail as a result. So I don't have the proximity. When I was in the living room in the same room, I think I'm a little too far away. It really wants a close uh, close Bluetooth connection here. So I'm actually just going to go back and I'm going to do the manual setup, which essentially the only main difference is here. I'll have to log in to the Apple account that I use for this stuff. I will do that. Oh, we got it a little bit before we get there. Next option, Siri. Of course, we want to use Siri. Privacy, right? Uh, question to the chat: Do you share? Do you use Apple devices? Do you share audio recordings? Do you do you, do you shut down all of this kind of, um, you know, make it better by sharing some of your information, sharing some of your interactions with our devices? I kind of go half and half on these. Uh, sometimes I I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever, and sometimes I do actually shut them down. This is a room where actually I, I feel like I wouldn't care that much about this Apple TV listening to what I say because we're pretty much only in here to use the room like a theater. We're watching movies and stuff like that. So if I'm down here using Siri, I'm probably doing something very specific. Tell it, hey, search for something. Or the, the one I really love is like, what did, what did they say? Where the Apple TV jumps back, whatever, 10 seconds or so, turns the subtitles on for you and then replays the scene so you can kind of read and watch. So in this case, like, hey, if, if my sharing like home theater centric commands could go into an anonymous database and help make Siri better, well, that's kind of one thing. Maybe on my phone where I'm around it all the time and I might be having some private conversations and you know everything's always listening to you. It's always odd, right, when you're talking about a product or a service just arbitrarily with your phone in the way and then you go get on you, you log into chrome or you go to facebook and all of a sudden you're seeing ads for that that thing that you mentioned right so in any case yeah we'll just go with we'll go with share recordings here all right so i am gonna pop this off here and i'm gonna have to log this in the old fashioned way. So the other really nice thing about the Apple TV is the fact that your mobile devices have the ability to function as Apple TV remotes, your iPhones, your iPads, etc. And doing that, you can have a touch type uh, keyboard to type stuff in because it is certainly a bit of a pain going all around these letters back and forth and back and forth to log stuff in. There is a, a kind of a tip that we'll get to as well, something that I very much like about, um, or one of the settings that I always change on my Apple TVs related to the keyboard. I make sure I think I'm typing in the right thing as I do it while I'm talking ultimate multitasking challenge but i don't like the strip keyboard on the apple tv there's a way to turn the keyboard into a grid that one's always my preference and the one that i recommend all right there we go oh apple id gotta get a number let's put our number in there we go one thing I like about Apple, you know, props to the company, whatever. I feel safe, as safe as you can get with a big tech company knowing everything about you and your life, I guess. But if there is one that I was going to pick, I have chosen Apple to be the one. All right, we're past that. Uh, require password. Uh, this, is, ooh, this is for when you're um, making purchases and all of, that, all of that sort of stuff. I never require. I'm not worried about. Um, 
of course, I don't want to have to enter in my passwords for my own purchases. My wife pretty much would never be the one in the household making like an audio video or content purchase because we would be doing it together as a family. And I'm not really worried about my kids um, as well. So no problem there. Just catching up on comments a little bit if there are any. Here's one here. Why don't you use NVIDIA Shield to allow pass-through audio through apps like Plex? Yeah, that is the fail. That is the one significant failure mode of the Apple TV. Um, I have a couple reasons why that doesn't bother me that much. And uh, we'll get to that uh, when we get kind of um, get to Infuse coming up. So have a TV provider. I do. I use YouTube TV, but I'm not going to do this right now. We'll do this later. So here you go. Here's the money feature. Again, the the the... When you pitch up your lawn chair and you sit out in the sun in the apple walled garden and you soak in all of the awesomeness of the platform while you're while you're locked in with the concrete walls around you that everybody likes to rip on you get cool stuff like this one home screen on every apple tv absolutely so what is this going to do well your apple tv tells icloud all about how it's set up what apps it has installed where they're located on the grid what folders they're in, what those folders are named. And it does two things. One, if you introduce a new Apple TV and you link it to the shared home screen, your Apple TV will automatically set itself up according to that. Fantastic. And the other thing is when they're all linked together live actively, um, if you make a change on one, you move some apps around, you put some stuff in a folder, you install an app for a new service or a streaming service or whatever you might have subscribed to, that app will get pushed to your other devices, oh, excuse me, and it will get put on the home screens in the same places, the same way. It's awesome, I love it. And we'll see that in action right here. So where is this Apple TV? We're going home theater, uh, location services, yep. Um, some streaming services and that increasingly so, we'll see what happens in 2023, are probably gonna very much care about where you're at um, as Netflix and others kind of crack down on password sharing. So I think we're gonna be needing uh, to give up some more privacy uh, to use some of these services coming up. Um, we'll see how all of that stuff goes. Uh, see the world aerial screensaver. Sure, I'll take them. Uh, analytics. I'm okay with analytics and that going, uh, partially because I'm a software developer. And hey, I appreciate customer feedback. I process field feedback, customer feedback, like tickets and issue entries and that stuff all day long. So. Again, I'm not too worried about Big Brother with um, Apple here in general. All right, we've got a whole bunch of terms and conditions. We could spend the next 45 minutes reading them, but we're not going to. So here we go. Get ready. Get ready for some magic. Boom, there it is. One home screen. So we, we, we launched the device there right into the initial default home screen. Didn't touch anything. Gave it a second, it hit up to iCloud, said, hey, what should this home screen look like? And here you go, boom, look at how fast these apps are installing. I think there's definitely a zippy factor um, to this processor upgrade. I think from an A12 in the last gen to this A15, this thing feels faster, movie walls load faster, playback, um, scrubbing, video, um, po movie posters in the walls, app start, uh, all of it. I've been pretty impressed with uh, with how this is working. So we're just gonna let it sit for a minute. We're gonna let it download all the stuff before we kind of start jumping in to anything specific. Let's look at a couple um, couple more questions here. Nate hey, Dog, how do you watch Netflix content with a 7.2 system since there is audio, their audio is only 5.1 or Adobe Atmos? Yeah, I mean, you take what you can get, right? So um, whenever I watch content that's not in the theater here, of course, that's not specifically already Dolby Atmos. I just use the Dolby surround up mixer. Um, I pretty much have my Anthem maybe on 70 pegged for every type of um, video codec or, you know, uh, lower channel count there th that there might be. That's not native Atmos. Just use the surround up, use the surround up mixer. And in my living room, that's a 2.2 zone. So multi-channel stuff um, doesn't matter there. Um, figure I bought all these speakers we put them all in I think the up mixer works great it it puts sound in places kind of where a lot of times you would want some ambient sound coming from I think Dolby you know all these companies they've been working on these software up mixer solutions for a long time and so 
um, that's that's what I use in the theater room here. Uh, Will says, what is it like watching Tubi on the Apple TV? Do the ads interfere in watching content? I, I have never used Tubi. Um, if anybody knows, if there is another Tubi user there, feel free to chime in. Um, what you think about it. I was, I was, uh, when I long, uh, what ways back now, actually, when I got rid of my, uh, actual cable TV and my, my TiVos, I was a long time TiVo user. Um, I went to direct or direct TV stream. And then I stayed using that through all the different permutations of direct TV or it was direct, direct TV. Now it had like five different names, whatever. They, and then it was AT&T something. And then direct, it ended up as direct TV stream got tired of some of the lack of features and problems with that along the way. And then I've been using YouTube TV now for a while. So I've been quite pleased overall with, with YouTube TV. Okay. So we are in, I should probably uh, mute this just in case we start anything up. We're looking at a 1080p 60 UI. We'll be changing that right away here. Um, but yeah, just to get an idea, right. I'm kind of, Look at how smooth and fast, just swiping left, swiping right, moving around. Got this games folder here. Um, so far, I haven't done too much with it yet, but I, that processor, I think, is, is uh, we jumped into Sneaky Sass Watch. It's running there. All the naysayers want to say, oh, Apple TV is trash for gaming. You should get an Xbox. Well, I have a $4,000 gaming PC, and I really like Apple Arcade. So there you go. Um, I think Sneaky Sass Watch is awesome fun. I think the, I mean, we like the Crossy Road. I think the way they brought some of these other mobile classics, so to speak, to Apple TV has been great. Um, I don't think I've, we, we've laughed, the four of us, playing a video game more than we have playing this cricket through the ages thing. It's just ridiculous. So, <clears throat> all right, let's go to settings. And let's roll through some settings. Uh, finish home setup. Let me just make sure. Oh, add this Apple TV to your home. Okay, yeah, I'll have to do that. Uh, I will do that after the fact, after the stream. So let's go down the list here. So general, uh, general, about, uh, you know what, actually the first thing we're gonna do before we even mess with settings, we're gonna do update. Software updates, we are gonna go betas because I am a beta kind of person. And we'll let that run before we start setting stuff up. So we got a couple minutes here to, to chat. If you have some questions, now's a great time to throw them out. Again, it's gonna take probably take a few minutes to do this update. All about TTK, how's it going? Good evening. All right, let's see, Magic Lakes, what we've got here. When I enable Dolby Vision 4K and disable frame rate matching dynamic range, I am able to get Dolby Vision for certain content on Amazon and Hulu. Is that fake Dolby Vision? Probably. Well, if you're, if you're setting the device up to a specific dynamic range and you're turning off frame rate matching, your display is always going to think that it's getting that signal but technically speaking, the Apple TV is going to put whatever it's getting into that container. So you can technically put like SDR in an HDR container. And if the process is done right, you really shouldn't see a problem or whatever because of doing that. Um, but I, I don't like that. And I, I don't like not, you know, fully kind of trusting what, uh, what I may or may not be getting from a device. So, and I'm usually kind of a native, native kind of configuration uh, prefer. So the question here, oh, so that's what I did before I went back to 5.2.2 using the up mixing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a fan of the up mixers. I think they're good. So let's go back to this question about bit streaming Plex. I think that's probably one of the hottest topics with regards to, um, Apple TV and, and all of that. And I'll, I'll, I can give some of my kind of frame of reference why why I still kind of like Infuse, why I don't mess with the other stuff. Um, and even if I were to have a 4K rip played in the theater, I'm still okay kind of like foregoing 
that native Atmos. So I think there's a couple saving graces that are that exist in general, and there uh, is a couple that are very specific, at least to, to me and my setup right now. Um, the one that's specific is because I have a Kaleidoscape. And to date, I still generally use the Kaleidoscape as kind of the premier, number one, most commonly used source for watching movies in the theater room. So I'm not super um, concerned about giving up uh, you know, one capability with regards to playing a local rip for all of the other benefits that I think using this solution for locally ripped playback provides. Because again, if it's if it's a big budget, mainstream, not streaming app specific film, I've got my K and to date I've been um, uh, content to stay invested in the Kaleidoscape platform, buy my movies there. And when big movies come out and, and that's usually the place that we're, we're watching them. So to date using rips and even though I've, I've still amassed a pretty decent sizable library of ripped content on my server, I still kind of consider that secondary. Um, and then there's the idea that if, if I wanted to recover that bit streaming capability, right? I would have to, I would have to do something different than I'm already doing. The Apple TV just can't do it. That's, that's the big problem. Doesn't matter if it's Plex or Infuse or whatever, that the TVOS, usually, I or more so I think a software issue than anything else, doesn't have the features. It's not into the software development kit. The apps can't access an ability to bitstream out Adobe Atmos soundtrack or a DTSX soundtrack from a ripped uh, Blu-ray, 4K Blu-ray. What they do do in the case of Infuse, at least, and I haven't specifically used Plex. I don't know if Plex and Infuse are similar in this regard, but I, I know Infuse and I trust Infuse in this sense. And so Infuse will take that uh, bit encoded Dolby Atmos audio, True HD Dolby Atmos. It'll take that bit encoded audio, whether it's DTS uh, HD master audio or DTSX track for both Dolby and DTS inside the Atmos audio track inside that container is like a true HD core mix. And it's the same thing for Dolby inside that DTSX audio package is like a core DTS HD master audio, basically like a 7.1 ish um, encoding. So that, that core can be accessed and that core can be decoded. And so Infuse will take the, the, that 7.1 core decode it to linear PCM, which is a lossless decoding of the Dolby or the DTS audio, and it will output it as discrete 7.1 channel PCM to your audio processor, to your audio system. So if you have RIPs, and if you're playing them on something like Infuse on an Apple TV, you are getting the true lossless audio from the disc for all seven uh, and your subwoofer channel or the 0.1 channel, LFE channel, of your audio, the only thing that you are missing is the metadata that allows the processor to take the information that would have gone to your heights or overheads and put it there, you know, natively according to the mix and the encode of the audio. You can still, as I was just talking about a little, a little bit ago, right? You can still use the up mixer on that 7.1 core lossless audio track. And is it the same? It's no, it's not, it's not native. The Atmos metadata is gone. Does the surround mixer do as good of a job as the native uh, provided mix is? Maybe. And having been around immersive audio for a while and reading a bunch of different takes on it, I can't tell you the number of times where I've heard somebody mention or, or write on a forum, right, uh, share something that says the... Um, I felt the surround the the surround up mixer did a better job on this than the native Atmos track. Well, because maybe the surround up mixer on the fly did some more active things for that specific film than the sound mixer in the studio that actually made the Atmos mix. I would venture to say, and this is where I think a lot of us in this hobby we get way too far kind of um, up our own rear ends with things, and we take things just a little too. I don't know too seriously. How, however you want to, however you want to characterize it, I, I would I expect I could sit down a bunch of people in this room, 
and I could play native Atmos content, you know, same movie, lossless mix, whatever native Atmos track. And I could play effectively the audio that Infuse would give the core seven one lossless with the up mixer and have people leaving this room um, from the same movie saying, wow, that sounded great. I could really tell the difference between those, you know, I could really feel, hear those heights and feel that immersive audio and all that stuff. I absolutely guarantee it. And if we did blinds and had you had to pick the difference between the two, unless you, you know, had prior knowledge of or you specifically knew the track, I, I think it would be a complete wash of um, of, of test results. I, I absolutely believe that. So that all said, I, I am comfortable enough because of many conveniences of, of choosing to do media this way, um, just playing the rips and, and get, giving up that, that native Atmos output sticking to the up mixer. And so, so then the next thing is, well, why not just get a different device, get a shield, right? Everybody likes, or a lot of people like the shield. That's great. As many people as I see, like, you know, leave a comment or, or, or like, oh, shield is the best shield is the best. Well, I see an equal number of people leaving similar comments to say that I had a shield and it failed me for this reason or that reason. And I moved to this other thing. There is no perfect device. Everybody has like specific elements that they're looking for out of their home theater gear, um, out of every single device they're using. Some devices do some things better than others. Every device, you know, over time is going to have some bugs and some failure modes. And so, you know, it is what it is. For me, I don't want to introduce more devices into my system. I have been striving to try to have less devices in my system. And so, no, and I am very much admittedly through all the other channel content and everything, an Apple ecosystem user. I've got an iPhone, I've got a MacBook, I've got an iPad, I've got Apple TVs, I've got an Apple Watch for the gym. We subscribe to Apple One, we use Apple Music, I buy my movies on iTunes. I have no reason or want to use something other than an Apple TV. I think it's the best streamer device for a number of reasons. Um, and I would not want to add a shield just for Plex, right? Or just for those rips, particularly again, because I'm largely um, still consuming content in my room, Kaleidoscape first. And Kaleidoscape, I, get, I do get the Atmos and all of that anyway. Now, even if I were to maybe issue the Kaleidoscape at some point and say, all right, I'm just going to go fully back to ripped content, I think I would still stick with the Apple TV and Infuse. I would stick to the Upmixer because I just don't want a different box and I don't necessarily want another box um, for, for one, one thing. That's the only thing that I would be using that shield for would be that bitstream output. And I can guarantee the rest of the family, if I said, okay, everybody, let's, let's sit down and go over the system config. And we've got this Apple TV and we're going to use this for like 99% of the stuff we do. But if you wanted to play a movie, you know, that we have on the server, well, go to this other box and go to this other app. Just forget about it. They're not going to, they're not going to do it. And I don't even want to mess with that. So to me that, and then the next question goes in, well, like, well, why not go for something like a Zipidi, right? Get a high end local media dedicated player, get a Zipidi, get a Zidu, get a Dune. Quite honestly, I've owned, I've never actually owned a Zidu. I've owned incarnations of devices, excuse me, from Zipidi, uh, from Dune and, and others that go back many years uh, into ripping history. They all have their failure modes as well. Um, I was just checking in on this the other day. Um, I, I stay subscribed on ABS forum to the owner's threads or the discussion threads around Zidu, Zipidi and all of that. And every once in a while, once a month or whatever, as I'm going through my followed threads, I'll jump in there and I'll skim through. Always kind of curious what people are talking about. And I swear to God, like universally, you go to those threads and what is the discussion? It's like how the device is failing. And the, the big one in the Zipidi over the last couple months or so, like since, uh, since summer-ish up till now was like the, Z, the Zipidi cloud infrastructure went down. And then when the Z, Zipidi cloud goes down, you lose all the access to all the metadata. And it's like, I, I, don't, I don't have facility time, interest or care for like that level of frustration in my life to, to set up things in, with, with a weak infrastructure. I want a strong infrastructure for my devices, for my system, for my setup. And to me, that right there, Infuse on an Apple TV 
is strong infrastructure, let alone the fact that like a premium Zipedi player is another thousand bucks or, or, or more, right? If you get the, the higher end model with the toroidal power supplies and all that stuff. So I don't know. To me, I just, I don't see it. And again, it's all about that bitstream audio. This is lossless 7.1 audio. And actually, you'd be surprised too if you rip a lot of 4K discs. Yeah, the majority really does do have um, do have Atmos and all that, but there's a surprising amount of of even 4K discs uh, for catalog titles and whatnot that still are are only true HD or, or more often than not potentially like DTS 5.1. All right, let's catch up on some comments here. We'll talk a little bit more about this, and we will dive into Infuse a little bit. Wish LG G2 support QMS VRR. I think they will. Um, based on my experience so far of owning the LG G2, I'm pretty pleasantly surprised with the amount of firmware updates that uh, LG is rolling out at a regular basis. You could argue, well, why do you need so many firmware updates? You're fixing problems, right? Fixing market bugs, field bugs. Well, yeah, that TV does still have some field bugs and stuff, but um, I, th I think we'll get it. On it, to me, though, I mean, the whole point of that QMS VRR stuff is so that when you like, if you have match frame rate on and you're at a 60 hertz UI like this and you start a 24, 24 hertz movie, you won't get a black screen. I mean, that LG goes black for, for half a second. I guess I have more patience for it, too. Or I guess if you have a dedicated theater room and you've got a projection set up, you probably have a whole lot of patience for how quickly a flat panel TV goes black and resyncs to signals versus a freaking projector which can take an eternity so yeah based on that if they get it cool if not that's no no harm no foul to me because i'm used to several seconds not not one um let's see follow up there usually at hdr 10 only for amazon and hulu with 4k sdr and frame rate matching um yeah, Hulu I haven't really tested or used much, but I can confirm through the other videos that have been on the channel doing like the streaming technical challenge face-offs, Amazon um, doesn't do really deliver much Dolby Vision. Um, get the same kind of Dolby Vision on the Shield. But then also too, different apps do different things on different devices. It really is kind of a, kind of a mess. Um, so should you use PCM other than Dolby Digital 5.1? Yeah, if you're outputting... Um, your Apple TV to a surround sound, surround sound multi-channel audio system, go with PCM. PCM is lossless, de uh, basically un decoded um, lossless audio. If you're having, you can get into some trouble uh, potentially with devices like this outputting as Dolby Digital because you might actually be re-encoding something that you don't want re-encoded. Um, not so, that's not so optimal. Uh, prepping new build for home theater media or basement starting with large oled cool uh, what would you have your builder put in the wall tv prep oh yeah data power hdmi yeah all of the above um more more ethernet ports than you think you might need like four if you think you might ever install uh, devices on the wall behind the screen get yourself four or six ethernet ports a um, couple of hdmi cables the, the best thing you can do honestly too conduit um I made that mistake in a few areas of my place and I, I should have had conduit where I pulled wires or I thought I pulled enough ethernet cables to future proof myself. And I didn't should have always had conduit. Julius, love Julius. Nice to see you. Uh, a couple comments about the settings. Yeah, we'll, we'll look at this right now. Um, batch frame rate versus not how it works, why you might want to use it and all that sort of thing. Uh, what's the difference going regular or beta for the Apple TV 4K? Well, beta just gets you software releases early, functionally, right? But you also get uh, releases while they're in development still, while they're in testing. So whenever you whenever you opt in for betas um, on a device, you're taking a little bit of a chance. Um, however, a lot, of, a lot of companies now that do beta programs do like advanced tracks, uh, like Windows, for example, with the insiders, you can get on a really, really advanced beta track where you're, you're like testing really cutting edge stuff. Um, or you can be on a bit of a slower track where it's a little closer to release early, but more stable. Um, I've always ran beta updates on my Apple TVs just because I'm, I'm a software guy. 
and I like new features and new capabilities. I like playing with them. I like getting them early. And to me, um, very rarely has an Apple TV beta ever been problematic for me. So fundamentally, it's just a way to get access to the features early. All right, so let's run through some stuff here. Screen savers, yeah, choose to use them if you want. Um, down here in the theater, like the Apple TV is never really left on, right? The theater is on when we're in here and it's off when we leave. It doesn't really sit in between. It's a projector, it's not an OLED, not really concerned about burn-ins and all of that. So fundamentally, um, down in the theater, I don't really have a, a need or whatever for uh, for a screensaver. And even if I'm watching music here, actually, I could probably turn this off. Um, if I am playing music, I would rather just have it stay on the cover art um, screen or the lyrics or something like that, rather than doing the, the aerial stuff. Well, I think I kind of messed up on this one because I said, yeah, go ahead and download the aerials. Um, and then here now I'm saying, well, I'm not even going to actually use them. but. Uh, That's fine. Upstairs in the living room, though, screensaver, sure, like after about 15 minutes, something like that. Um, appearance, light mode, dark mode. Anybody have a preference? Do you like light modes? Do you like dark modes? I have to say, in general, when it comes to UIs, I'm a light mode. I have a light mode preference. Um, I, I like I like brighter UIs, but in the dark, in a theater room, light UIs can sometimes... Um, sometimes get you. I do like the automatic settings, particularly for a TV in a living room. Go light during the day, right? If you're using it, go dark in the evening, down here in the theater, just because I don't want a wash of light, you know, straining, straining my eyes or whatever. Um, I usually go dark. Sleep after. So I'd normally been setting my Apple TVs to sleep, and this is kind of an integration pain point that, I, that I've had where I really wish that Apple TV did better integration with Control 4 than they do. Um, and in the past, there were better drivers available than the ones that are available right now that communicated a little more actively, shared state, and that sort of thing. But that broke, um, I want to say, with like Control 4, one of the prior OS versions, and, and now we've got pretty limited drivers. I hope this changes when we get the Control 4 halos. But one of the things that I really hate is in the Control 4 settings, you can enable to have like the menu command sent to your Apple TV in order to wake it up when, and that's, that's the only thing control four can really do to say, okay, Apple TV come online and work. Well, if your Apple TV is already on and um, that command is executed, that will kick your Apple TV into the screensaver. So let's just show this. So, excuse me, if we go back to the screen here and I hit menu, we're into the screensaver. So constantly you have control four, sometimes because it doesn't know it doesn't know state it's not it's not sharing information it doesn't have the intelligence you end up like kicking yourself into the screensaver or even when you're on a, like a neo remote you're changing from the apple tv to another input you kick yourself back to the screensaver i hate that um and one thing that i've seen with the new one uh, referenced is that like the power draw on this thing is minuscule meaning like you can have this apple tv just on 24 7 never sleep always be active hdmi signal no need to wake up no need to resync and we're talking like dollars right or, or dollar or something a year i want to i want to research that a little bit more probably even put it on a kilowatt and really really measure it for myself but i'm thinking for this new model with its power efficiency in both spaces i'm just having it basically never never sleep um, and set up control four then to no longer send the menu command and that way I just turn stuff on and it's there and I don't have this like kick into the screensaver kind of hassle um, hassle factor. Or another thing with Control 4 doing that is like you've got playback of something started and paused, then you flip Control 4 to some other device for a moment to do something. You flip back to the Apple TV, it sends the menu command because it thinks it needs to wake it up again because there's no state. Kicks you out of your content, drives me nuts. So. All right. Um, restrictions, privacy. We're going to skip this stuff. Um, languages, English. So here we go. This is the one that I that I strongly recommend changing. Keyboard layout, auto. So sometimes you'll get linear. Sometimes you'll get grid. I really like the grid. So we'll see the difference. I think everybody knows the long strip of letters and numbers that makes up kind of the normal Apple TV on-screen keyboard. You got to go left and you got to go right and back and forth. Grid 
compacts everything over on the left hand side. I think that's a great setting. Um, Sirion shouldn't really have too much to deal with in here. And we did get the 16.2 beta update, which I believe 16.2 has some of the new Siri um, changes in it in terms of how uh, things pop up on the screen and how Siri works and all that. Pretty cool. All right, time zones automatically. Uh, no secret there, I'm in Southeast Michigan, 12 hour time format. So that's pretty much it for the main menus here or the general settings anyway, where is that grid, that's the that's a key one. And then whatever you want for kind of power and screensaver settings. Um, I'm gonna skip users and accounts because that would show some things that I don't wanna show. And let's get to the to the money page. I think this is the one probably of some of the highest interest. So format, what does this do? Format defines the format that the Apple TV will send out nominally at the menus and, and so on. I don't know, I'm actually kind of intrigued that it went to 1080p SDR versus 4K SDR. Not sure on that one, but in any case, by default, um, I set my television, I set my Apple TV to um, standardize to default to menus and all of that, use the 4K SDR at 60 Hertz setting. And we should be able to see this here if I pull up the projector info, uh, kind of hard to read there, but we've got it 24, 2160p, 60 uh, YUV video levels, 8-bit BT709 color space. So what that allows us then to do next is set our HDMI output level. And here's also where some new conjecture came in. So um, I always generally default my devices to video levels, right? YCBCR. And when you're outputting to a display device, generally speaking, like a television, um, you kind of generally want video levels because you don't want conversions between RGB and video levels back and forth. Can, can probably th these conversions are done so fast and very accurately, they probably don't introduce real problems into your video chain or your setup. But when we're talking about video devices connected to video devices, why bother doing kind of errant conversions. And so I usually stick uh, to video levels on everything that I configure. Now I have just now recently seen some folks mention, why don't you use RGB high, which should still work here with the projector and all of that. Um, I guess some real studious folks, and I don't know if this was just on AVS forum or if it was on some other places as well, um, did some some real detailed measure. I don't I don't have the whole whole history, but high level High level story here, some real studious folks did some real detailed technical measurements using the Apple TVs and came to the conclusion that for, for SDR uh, range content, the video levels are off. There's some flickering there. There's some problems in there. If you set it to RGB high, you don't get that. Um, however, it doesn't affect HDR content. And so I don't know. What I can say is that I've been using Apple TVs for a long time. I've been setting them to video levels for a long time. I have not um, noticed any problematic issue with flickering or color pushes or anything like that. So this is a setting that I might play around with a little bit more, um, try to be a little more critical with, go back and forth and see if I discover something that pushes me towards RGB high. The only other thing I could say is that fundamentally, You've got a video device connected to a television type of display. You would want to choose video levels, not do those extra conversions. And to me, it's kind of a sucky thing when when there's even like a question of, right, should, do I have to pick this other thing? To me, that's kind of like a bit of a um, a bit of a hack even to say, like, let, let's use this other setting that should kind of objectively be wrong, but because of some problems or whatever, and then who knows, in a different version of the software, or a different version of a device, things could change. And then you were doing, you were setting this setting kind of as a hack because folks, uh, you know, kind of came to a consensus that that might be the better setting. And then in a new version of software, the things change. I don't think you can go wrong with either one of these. If you really want to be super exacting um, with your setup, maybe do some searching on ABS form. You can find the threads, you can find the discussion and maybe try RGB high. Um, I'll, I'll mess around with that a little bit. And if I define or find something 
specific, um, you know, of course I'll make some content about it, make some comments about it, um, coming up, but in any case, we'll just stick to video levels here right now, which means chroma, we can select 444. That's basically full uncompressed color. You should really always opt for 444 from your video devices whenever possible. So then folks often ask, well, isn't video like, um, like a movie on a disc or streaming something encoded at 422 or I'm sorry, 420. Yes, it is. But that, that 420 compressed color space still has to get expanded to be 444. And this is another kind of area where you have a question like, where do you want that expansion to take place? And you want to make sure that that expansion only happens once that it doesn't get like uncompressed and then recompressed and uncompressed. So uh, by, by, I think, virtue of, of preferable settings, so to speak, I would always prefer to have my video device output 444. Now that we have HDMI 2.1 as well with higher bandwidth, we can do 444 chroma at higher frame rates. My PC can do video levels 444 at uh, full 4K, 120 hertz, saturating, uh, or all the way up to to uh, 12 bit uh, 12 bit color, saturating a 48 gigabit um, HDMI 2.1 link. It's awesome. <clears throat> so I, I would default to this. The other part of it too is like this affects the way that UIs look. So you know, it, even on a PC, on a gaming system or, or whatever, it's one thing that the game might output at a certain level. Um, but, you know, desktop and UIs and the, the sharpness, clarity and such of the text that you're seeing in the UIs, you want that, you don't want that to be being compressed down. So you, if, if anything else, you would just want to make sure to choose 444 in order to have your, your UIs and your text render um, as, as sharp as possible. So here to comment here, yeah, green tint push at video levels for SDR content only, according to AVS. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'll, I'm gonna spend some some research time on that, and may may end up settling over on the RGB high. Uh, we'll see. Um, so in conjunction with choosing 4K SDR as the base format of the device, you want to make sure that these other options are set: match dynamic range, match frame rate two of the most kind of wonderful settings, I guess you could say, um, on the Apple TV. And the way Apple makes them work now is is pretty much spot on. So with both of these on, I'm looking at a 4K um, 60 FPS video level 444 Chroma UI right now. If I start playback of an iTunes movie or a piece of content, um, Sorry, doing a little block. I don't think anybody's looking. Only kind of love we want right now is video, the video kind, not that kind of video kind. Um, so you start playback of an HDR movie, you'll get an automatic changeover to HDR10 or Dolby Vision or whatever the, whatever it needs to go to. Or we're going from a 60 hertz UI to a 24 hertz movie. We'll get that change as well. I'm a big fan of using match content. Um, for both uh, both of those settings. I think I'm gonna go ahead and just do this because it's telling me like that it had some unver I've never I hadn't really actually seen that before. Unverified settings. Normally the device kind of does uh, I thought it did all that stuff uh, automatically. So we'll just go ahead and let it run through its its HDMI test, verify what exactly it's able to get. I know, I mean it should we get 4K60 um, SDR here, we get 4K 60 and 24 um, HDR10, because we're talking about a JVC projector, not an NZ. So unfortunately I can't test, I can't use the HDR10 plus, at least not yet. Stay tuned. And no Dolby Vision, of course, um, on a projector. All right, while our HDMI connection test is running here, just looking through for some questions. Clyde Escape, value proposition, expensive, expensive for all people. Well, pretty much all people. Do you feel you use it enough to justify the upfront cost? I don't know. It's hard for me to say how much money you should or shouldn't spend on something. Um, obviously, I bought one, so I felt 
that I justified it enough to go ahead and buy in to the platform. Um, the first Kaleidoscape that I bought, I bought a used player off of eBay. It was a Strato with the, 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 of course, the player and the storage all in one. And if you're looking for a less expensive way to get into Kaleidoscape, you can still find uh, used Stratos, six terabytes or 12 terabyte models. They pop up um, on Kscape Owners Forum and other places, oftentimes in like the five to $6,000 range. Um, I've upgraded since then. I have the, the Strato C and uh, now a new compact Terra 12 terabyte uh, MSRP wise. That's about ten thousand ish dollars of Kaleidoscape equipment. That's a pretty hefty, um, you know, pretty hefty cost level to get into. Um, it's it represents a, a, a chunk, you know, but a fraction of everything that I have spent on audio video. So I'd say it's in. Um, to me, it's in line with what I've what I've spent on the rest of my system. I'm getting more of these uh, spammer things in here, so try this again. You know, so if I don't know if you have the means, it, uh, I highly suggest picking picking one up. To quote Ferris. Um, it's, it's a really cool system, but you know, you, it's expensive and you really want to think about the why, right? Why am I buying this? What am I getting? What is it doing for me? What is it doing for my life? What is it doing for my entertainment? Um, that I would want to spend this much money on something, you know, like this. Is it because of the, the simplicity? Is it because I have a system, I've got a really, really premium home theater system and it it's balanced, you know, in the budget. If you've got less than $10,000 of equipment for your entire um, you know, system, and you're looking at a 65 inch television, and yeah, I don't know, probably then like a ten thousand dollar Kaleidoscape doesn't make a lot of sense. But you got a hundred thousand dollar theater or fifty thousand dollar theater, dedicated room, and and you want the conveniences and all the things that K brings, then it's a different it's a different value proposition. Then, all right, your HDMI connection looks good, excellent. Okay, um, so that's the video side. That's what that's what I generally run for video. One other thing that I will say, though, that I've contemplated as kind of a change between the living room and the theater room is uh, one of the worst things about a projector is uh, particularly like these JVC NXs. When it goes into HDR, this model and the higher ones, they have color filters. and It takes a little bit of time for those color filters to move into place. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to hear it, if, if my AirPods will pick it up, but I'm going to put it in HDR mode. Yeah, try HDR. Let's see how long it takes waiting for the color filter. There's the projector starting to, okay, here it goes. Still thinking, okay, there, there it is. That's how long it takes to, for a JVC projector with a color filter to change between HDR and SDR modes. And if I go back, 4K SDR mode, the color filter just moved, still waiting. Still waiting. And there we go. So that's kind of a pain, right? Um, maybe not so much when you're sitting down to watch a two hour movie, what's an extra five seconds at the beginning of the movie and an extra five seconds at the end of the movie. I, um, but there, there are times where I might be down here tinkering around with something, demoing some scenes for people, whatever. And, you know, I'll either actually be inclined to shut the color filter off as I'm jumping between content because I'm tired of it, waiting for it, hearing it and just the electrical wear and tear or mechanical wear and tear of that thing moving in and out. On a flat panel on the OLED or whatever, who cares? It's like a second. But I have considered leaving the Apple TV in HDR mode down here just so that when everything turns on, color filter goes in. I'm probably down here to watch like a new movie, a remastered movie, something 4K. It's probably in HDR, and I could avoid that that extra uh, sync time and mechanical time and all of that. But again, unless you're like really jumping in and out of demos a, a ton, to me, it's not it's not a huge deal. All right, let's talk about audio, audio output. Out, outputting to the TV speakers. If In this menu for an Apple TV, if you wanted to change this, you could have it wirelessly send sound to other things. Like if you have the, 
the HomePod speakers and, and that sort of stuff. Audio format, it already detected it, um, that this system, the system that it's connected to, of course, supports Dolby Atmos, and we want Dolby Atmos on, change format off. And with these settings, we, we will be guaranteed to get the best audio that we can get um, you know, out of an Apple TV. And if we want, if we do opt to change format, which I think one of the earlier questions would say, well, you could set it up for Dolby Digital 5, 5 5.1 or something else along those lines. You don't want it doing that. You don't want a device, unless you have a very specific setup, maybe it, it would take su such a very specific set of devices in a certain way that you that you would want a device like re-encoding to a lossy, a very lossy audio format. It's just not the way that you really want to use this stuff. Um, have it do stuff like this. You'll get PCM decoding. You'll get Atmos bitstream, and you, you you kind of get the best of everything. And uh, between the Apple TV and your devices, your audio system, and all of that, and and you know you're good to go. Uh, navigation clicks. All these other things are are kind of to taste. Um, automatic subtitle settings, and then the calibration pieces. We're not going to mess with any of that stuff tonight. I. Overall, these calibration things, I don't think they work very go very well um, at, on the surface anyway with the projector. It's meant to like hold your phone up to uh, a screen uh, so that it can read the light and the color coming off of the screen. You obviously can't do that in a projector. I do believe, again, some more studious folks around AVS and their places have found ways to uh, use the Apple TV calibration uh, with your phone and a projector by doing certain things or holding holding stuff in certain ways. I haven't messed with it. The other thing about using the Apple TV for color calibration is it only affects the Apple TV. And so, you know, in the theater here, I use a Kaleidoscape. And so I, this isn't something that I've actually messed around with very much. Maybe I will play with it in the living room and, and make some future content around it. If you've used the AutoCal uh, and, and phone Cal integration features of the Apple TV, if you had some good or bad results, sound off in the comments and, and let me know. Let us know. So C. Oliver Parker says, what's the advantage of HDR over SDR? So HDR is high dynamic range. SDR is standard dynamic range. Basically, with the move to 4K HDR video content, uh, we're talking about uh, the ability uh, to do larger color spaces, larger color volumes, and be able to have very dynamic uh, larger differences between bright things on the screen at the same time where there might be dark things on the screen and having, you know, that kind of um, impactful differentiation uh, between them. Heard a lot, a lot of people say like the that HDR makes the bigger difference in image quality versus resolution. Getting HDR video has been a bigger, bigger boost, a bigger benefit than going from HD to 4K. Hey, I'll take them both. Um, I'll take them both any day of the week over one or over the other. But yeah, HDR content, when you have the setup for it, you have the devices that can actually do the dynamics, hit hit higher levels of brightness and all that. It um, it adds a lot, lot to your video performance. All right, so other stuff in here and notifications, um, not really much to look at in there. Airplane home kit. So one of the things about uh, Control 4, in Apple TV is that basically Control 4 controls Apple TV through HomeKit. And so um, the actual way to set this up is using the HomeKit app on a phone uh, and essentially having the Apple TV uh, d designated there. And then you kind of Control 4 points to the HomeKit uh, driver, HomeKit interface that it's able to find on the local system. And then the Apple TV presents itself that way. So these these features all work pretty good. It's the, the only thing that I've actually used HomeKit for. Um, I do occasionally use AirPlay, uh, that sort of stuff. Another nice side effect of or nice uh, feature benefit of the Apple ecosystem. All right. So remotes and devices. A couple of options that are kind of neat in here. If you don't like the ability to swipe, right on the new remote, we have both the kind of circular touchpad in the middle surrounded by the ring, the clickable uh, ring. You can go click only, which means now that I don't get any swipe effect. But if I go back to click and touch, I can do I can do both. I leave it on both. The reason why, the main reason actually why I, I like 
the ability I retain like to retain the ability to do touch is scrubbing. Um, particularly like uh, for somebody like me doing the channel, doing content, jumping into content or video content, pausing, wanting to go to a certain place in a movie. Nothing beats being able to just pause and, and swipe a few times um, and get there versus like clicking or some apps on the Apple TV will let you kind of click and hold and they'll, they'll zoom pretty fast. Not every app actually implements that the same way though. So I like click and touch. I leave the tracking on medium. That tracking, of course, if you go fast, means it will move more, right, relative to the, the type of touch that you give it. Slow makes it less responsive. I do change this TV button. Give me the home screen. I don't want that Apple TV app. I have very little reason, actually, to use the Apple TV app. I don't like it. Maybe I'm a little bit of an Apple TV ludite um, in, that, in that sense, but um, I don't. I'm not a big fan of it. I use it for Apple TV Plus content, of course, because you have to. But even for iTunes movies, and we'll talk about this maybe in, in a little bit here, but um, I use the iTunes movies app. I don't like the Apple TV app for my library content. Uh, remote, that's the remote we're holding right here. Serial version, firmware, battery level, et cetera. Awesome USB-C charging. Let's get rid of lightning. Um, other devices, Bluetooth. Um, eventually, uh, in order to have your phone and iPad connect, you'll have to type in the code and then they'll show up as devices uh, through here, remote app. But so far I haven't connected anything. That's fine. Um, learning remote. So if you want um, this uh, remote to be able to send IR codes, essentially for volume control uh, of another device, you can teach it or you can teach it to the Apple TV. Technically, you don't teach the remote. Actually, you, you take the remote that you want to learn from and you uh, send it to the Apple TV itself, and then it, it gets the codes and applies them essentially to, um, to this remote. <clears throat> in the theater, I don't use it. I don't have any need for kind of IR uh, control in here, but in the living room, I have a video all about this. I have an IR extension, uh, an IR receiver and an extension down to my rack so that I can use this remote in the living room to control volume and mute uh, my, my Anthem STR because I don't have HDMI uh, eARC the STR doesn't have an eARC uh, uh, audio input, so I can't use HDMI CEC for the volume control, and so I use the IR there instead. Um, and right now here in the theater, I'm not using any type of control, so um, no CEC on and off and no volume control either. I, I, I would like to be able to control the AVM70 with this via CEC, the reason that I don't have this setup is kind of specific to a little bit of more of my, like maybe more advanced setup. And that's because I use the, the AVM70 zone two. And what you'll find is that if you have a, a receiver, a preamp, whatever it might be, if you're using multi-zone, the kind of universal recommendation is don't, um, don't use, don't try to use CEC. CEC will get confused potentially between like devices from different zones potentially sending commands and um, and all of that. I think because I never accessed this Apple TV in zone two, I probably would be safe um, and I need to try it. But because in some ways, at least for right now, I do find this remote far superior to this $500 control for Neo thing. I can't wait for the halos. We'll see what happens when the halos come out. Accessibility, I don't touch anything in here, apps. Um, I like automatically update apps, and I do not like automatically install apps. Why? Because b just because I installed something on my phone doesn't mean I want the video uh, companion of that thing installed on my Apple TV. And then because of the home screen syncing, it'll go it get installed everywhere. So I leave that off. Um, I might I might flip apps or put things on and take things off of my phone more actively not on the Apple TV. It's it's a whole lot more stable than that. So I, I leave that off. And I don't like the offload thing either. Now we've got 128 gig, awesome, of storage space. Shouldn't have to be offloading anything, even if you do have a decent number of games, right, and all of that stuff loaded here. Now, some apps do have um, specific settings. There's, there's maybe some um, visual customizations that you might want to do in here. The Apple TV app, lets you configure some stuff for sports. It lets you configure um, the top shelf, meaning if you have the app on the home row, what do you, you know, what do you see up above it? 
music, you do want to make sure if you are an Apple Music user, Dolby Atmos, of course, you want it. There's not an on. It's either off or automatic. But audio quality, no reason at all not to be streaming lossless, right? Take that 24-bit, uh, 48 kilohertz. Apple TV, Apple Music uh, can go higher. Apple TV is still stuck at 2448. Um, can you hear it? I don't know. I won't, won't get into that right now. But, hey, it provides it, so why not use the highest quality that you can get out of it? And maybe in a, in a coming tvOS uh, version, we'll be able to get higher than 2448. Uh, we'll see. But that, that's a key one there that you do have to opt in for. iTunes movies and videos. Um, I do change this one here, sort movies. I don't want to see movies sorted by dates. I want to see my content always sorted alphabetically. Uh, quick change there. Computers, fitness, podcasts, none of that stuff really has any settings. Infuse, background app refresh. You want that because then it will pick up changes that you might be making to your library as you add content and movies anywhere and Netflix. Not really much in there. Um, Network. So I will have to change this. Um, we might as well go ahead and do that. Let me just verify the IP address that I want. Pretty sure in my system, this will be 81. I have a Nerdy little OneNote table of all my settings. Yeah, this needs to be 81, ultimately, in order for Control 4 to set it. So right now, by default, of course, most devices, they'll use DHCP out of the box. They'll hit your router. They'll say, hey, router, give me an IP address. And your router will give them an address in the ranges that it's configured for. In my case, we want to change this to manual. And I'm going to change it to a fixed number that the home theater Apple TV is expected to be found on by my control systems and all of that stuff. So it will reconnect. It will get its new IP address, and we'll be good to go. We're fine since we're using the remote here. And then, of course, we already looked at the system menu earlier. That's where we did the software update. Now, one of the questions, how do you get access to that cool streaming overlay where you can see the data and the bit rates and all that? That shows up here when you have the device opted in uh, to the Apple developer program. Maybe we'll get actually to, to doing that, setting that up. And that's the settings menu. Um, if anybody has questions about settings, preferences, all that sort of stuff, you know, fire, fire away. There's more here. We're not done yet. We can play around with... Uh, with some more things, I've got some more time. Uh, so let's see here, a question. Does it upscale to 4K when playing a 4K Blu-ray rip from Plex or Infuse? Um, yeah, so there is no match resolution, right? It's match frame rate, it's match dynamic range. The box does not have match resolution. So it means that basically it's always outputting 4K res. So if you play anything lower than 4K res, you're uh, upscaling right, essentially is going to be provided by the Apple TV box itself. Let's see, anything else that I might have missed? All right, I think we're good. Yeah, keep them coming. All right, so what do we want to see here? I guess one of the things that I'll talk about, we're talking about Apple TV preferences, stuff that I like. Let's spend a minute chatting about this. Right, we have the Apple TV app and we have the iTunes movies and iTunes TV shows apps. Why do you want to use one versus the other? And I do want to break this out into a dedicated video. So historically speaking on the Apple TV, we had the can the candy colored apps, right? The blue and the purple ones. And then along the way, we got this thing. Apple tried to make the Apple TV uh, app, they, as we saw in the settings, right? They try to make it the home screen. They try to make it the main interface of the device. To me, that's terrible. Not every, not all these um, other services are tied into the Apple TV app. And if it's not universally applicable to everything you have on your system, it's not, it's no good at all. So I only use this thing for, um, 
Oh, we got to do this uh, sharing. This is a new feature. Yeah, we want to allow some of these new sharing things. So I only use the Apple TV app itself for Apple TV Plus and not the, not the library pieces of it. Of course, the library pieces are here, right? You can come in and there's right off the bat a few things that I don't like. One, I don't like how it gives you the kind of like um, landscape posters. I like my movie posters a little more traditional, portrait mode, movie poster. I don't like these. Um, it's, it's taken a little while. I've got like a 1500 movie iTunes library. So that's actually pretty darn quick, um, pretty darn quick for this device. But so instead of a vertical, more traditional cinema feeling movie poster, they did this instead. And I just, I, I don't, to me, I don't like this. So that that's a knock. That's a negative for me. And if you've got some older content, I think more so now, like most most pieces of content have been given, uh, here's one, like, right, a nice looking artwork that fits the aspect ratio. But if if there's content that doesn't, and there's still a decent amount of it that doesn't, they embed like the poster in the middle of the landscape thing. And it's just like for presenting my movie library, I, I don't know, to me, this is like, this is just lame. I, I don't like the way it looks. I don't like the way it presents. Um, if you go in, to start playback, you do go through the regular Apple TV menus and stuff. That's nice, at least, right? So you can get to these uh, um, movie menu pieces in order um, to get to the extras and all that. So it, it still ultimately lands you in the same place. It you, it still lands you in the same um, movie, the same video player, and so on. I do like you know the 4K HDR filter. I think library management is an area where Apple needs to do more. Uh, stuff basically. Um, Voodoo lets you make custom collections. I would like to be able to make custom collections in here, not just have access to their genres um, and stuff like that. But yeah, to me, I don't know. I just I don't like that that UI. So in this watch now page, to me, is a convolution of like so much stuff. Your up next list gets all this stuff gets pushed into it. To me, it's a hassle. It's unwieldy. The only thing I ever use this app for is right here, Apple TV specific content. And as we saw in the settings, when I when I hit this home button, I don't want to go here, right? I want to go here. That's that's my strong preference. Um, and so if we go into the movies, iTunes movies app itself, right, the one that everybody knows, still have the store, still have the search, all of that stuff, but over here in purchased very similar list it's almost the exact same list right but they don't give you the 4k hdr filter anymore here they do tell you the counts it's it's so stupid like why does it's borderline the same uis and one is missing some things and and has other things and the other is missing other things and has other things it makes no sense so i would like to see the 4k hdr entry Again, I would like to see that collection management. I, I like seeing my library counts, 1,500 movies, probably way too many. Um, but portrait, right? Portrait mode, uh, portrait aspect, movie posters. That's how movie posters are supposed to look. And if you actually go into a piece of content, rather than starting playback, right, you go to this screen. To me, I like this screen, the, the, this metadata screen. I like knowing the runtime, the year. I get my 4K HDR information here. I really, really like having access to Common Sense Media and Rotten Tomatoes. Rotten Tomatoes could be maybe the, the more dubious um, of those, but you know, being able to come in here, I've got younger kids. Sometimes when we're looking for stuff, we consult this. You know, it's not a, it's not a whole truth or an end all be all by any means, but it, it's at least a guide, and you know, we can make our own decisions about what's right for our family and stuff. But I, I, I love having access to the common sense media data, being able to pull, right, pull some of this stuff up and take a look at it, you know, seeing the cast and crew details and being able to go to the bottom and see some technical information about the piece of content and jump around at it. I love the, I love also watched, right, when you're in a piece of content, the, the value of the discoverability. So yeah, to me, personally speaking, I hate the library component of the Apple TV app. 
I so, so much prefer these iTunes movies and TV shows. And I cross my fingers every TVOS release that they don't take these away. Um, Cause at some point in time, I would, I fear that, that these might get deprecated out and, uh, and go away. They did it on the Mac basically, right? The, the desktop iTunes historic app as we know it and Mac OS is gone forevermore. And in its place, we have the Apple TV app. I actually run traditional iTunes in my in a Windows VM virtual machine on my Mac because I think it, there there's certain things that I do in it that are just better. Um, so, soapbox off. Let's see a couple of questions. Um, why YouTube TV over Hulu with live TV? Um, I, I kind of I guess a little bit of an affinity. I, I'm not a super Google user, uh, but from a YouTube perspective, I'm here. I like YouTube. Um, and it seemed that when I was ready to move off of direct TV stream based on the research that I did and the, the handful of services that were available, what they offered, how they worked, uh, what I wanted out of them and all of that to me, I thought YouTube TV was, was the, the next, next best choice for me. Um, so I probably am overdue to try a couple of other services, at least maybe in some trials. And uh, and make some content about kind of my take my take on them. So everyday Jay says I have Hulu TV now. That's about to be over eighty bucks a month. Thinking of switching to Apple Apple TV. Well, do you mean Apple TV Plus or so Apple doesn't have a um, so Hulu Hulu TV would be the streaming television subscription, not a box. But when we're talking about Apple TV, we're talking about a box, and Apple TV Plus is their service. But Apple TV Plus is not the same thing as as uh as hulu tv you're not getting live channels and broadcast okay youtube tv got it right just a typo yeah so I, um like i said I'm, I'm overdue to probably fire up some trials maybe give it give a look at hulu go back it's been a long time since i took a look at sling um but yeah so I, I don't know how long it's been now well, it was in the earlier part of doing the channel, and I started the channel last June. So I'm probably coming up on close to a year of, YouTube, of being a YouTube TV subscriber. Uh, we got a shout-out from Dallas, Texas. Awesome. Uh, another comment. Uh, think about ordering a third-gen Apple TV for my Samsung. As the Apple TV, HR10 is there, but it doesn't seem to be my, I mean, for the price difference, uh, Jay, buy the, new, buy the new one for sure, especially with the Samsung TV. Um, I can't test it. I don't. I have an LG uh, panel in my living room. I've got a JVC NX projector here, so I can't kick up HDR10 Plus content. But I'm paying attention to you know owners forums and and that, and it seems like uh, people are are pleasantly surprised with the amount of real HDR10 content uh, available for playback within iTunes themselves and other apps. So yeah, I mean, you might get a 2021 model for hundred bucks versus getting this 128 gig 2022 model for 150. I mean, if that, if that's a, if that's an issue in your budget, by all means, save the money. But if you have it 50 bucks, I would, I would take the new one all day long. Yeah. YouTube TV was the first to offer Dolby and unlimited DVR storage. Yeah. I think uh, Apple TV, that was one of the times where like a service and an app lagged a little bit. I think on Apple TV, but I believe YouTube TV does 5.1 now on the Apple TV. I want to say that was added this past summer. Quite honestly, that was, um, I didn't even care to pay attention, inconsequential uh, element of it for me. Because if I'm coming, if I'm watching YouTube TV, I'm probably in the living room. I'm not going to come down here to watch YouTube TV. Um, so I'm on a two channel system up there. If I'm coming down here, I'm, I'm coming to watch a movie or something else along those lines. All right, let's see. What else can we talk about? Well, the blue dots, the blue dots mean an app has been updated since the last time that you had accessed it. Of course, since everything was newly downloaded, we haven't accessed anything yet. A uh, little bit of a tip there. All right, let's fire up Infuse. By now, um, yeah, I'm okay with this as well. Support Infuse. So in the video that I made uh, the other or last weekish or earlier in the week, 
four earlier in the week. I fired up Infuse and I'm like, oh, it didn't, you know, maybe I have to set up my server or that sort of thing. Well, you don't. You just got to wait long enough. <laughs> Again, iCloud. iCloud to the rescue. So C. Oliver Parker says, do you use Infuse? Yes, I do. So let's take a look at it and talk a little bit about uh, talk a little bit about Infuse. So um, Infuse syncs all of your library settings and its metadata and all that stuff to iCloud. Boom, there it is, right? Whoop, there it is. I have two Apple TVs. I have my MacBook where I can access Infuse. I have my phone. I have my iPad. They can all run the Infuse app. They can all access content on my Synology. It is all cloud synced and managed in between. That includes um, all of the metadata parsing for the library of content uh, that I keep on my NAS, as well as watch status and playlists and everything in between. It's just fantastic. I do believe you have to have the pro version of Infuse to get the iCloud sync. We can see right there, iCloud sync is on. And if I go into my library, it's indexing, right? Fetching metadata for all this stuff. I can tell you, right? Another, another point, uh, another measure where this 2022 model and its processing just just screams, it's right here. This this indexes metadata, indexes your collection, rushes through this. I think uh, pretty significantly faster than the 2022 model did. Uh, bigger chunks, faster processing, and all of that. So this will take a minute. To, to kind of finishing its, its download, its update, its local metadata, artwork fetch. Um, it's grabbing posters actually from, uh, from my server. I do, when I, when I put a movie on my server and present it to Infuse, um, I do go to the movie database and I custom pick the poster that I like for that film, right, or that series. And that overrides the default one that it would pick uh, from TMDB, whatever one the community has voted to be the first one. More often than not, I would say, I don't end up picking the first poster. Um, but so that, that'll that take a second to run. I'm not gonna mess with anything. Let's take a look for some questions here. Do you know a way to get lossless audio from Plex or any other local server on the Apple TV? So there it is. No, again, no, there, there well, actually the way you phrased your question, Jay, lossless audio. Yes, in fact, you can get lossless audio. You cannot get Dolby Atmos audio or DTSX audio from these devices or from an Apple TV, from Infuse or whatever. The box, the tvOS, the software, the software development kit that Apple provides to the app makers does not have the, the features, the facility, the calls, the support to take a Dolby Atmos soundtrack from an MKV, from a RIP and have the app output it bitstream to your processor, to your receiver. Um, it's just not there and it, it is Apple's decision choice um, if if in fact they ever decide that they want to do that i have full faith and trust that it's apple holding that up it's not infuse if, if infuse could have done it they would have done it a long time ago um, if the facility if the capability to do it was in the sdks and they could build it into their app but what you do get is 7.1 lossless audio so every dolby atmos container functionally has a 7.1 true hd track uh, inside of it every dtsx audio track has a 7.1 dts hd master audio track inside of it infuse will take true hd and the core part true hd part of that atmos track infuse will take dts master audio or the dts master audio core part of that dtsx track it will decode it to 7.1 pcm that is a lossless decoding. It is a lossless audio output. And so, yes, you can get lossless audio from Infuse. I don't know if Plex does the same thing on Apple TV. I'm overdue to probably answer that question. I'm not a Plex user. I prefer Infuse in the Apple ecosystem. I think it's the superior way to go um, for a variety of reasons. Um, but, and, and, but I know Infuse does, it retains that lossless audio output. And doesn't get the Dolby Atmos, doesn't get the Dolby Atmos metadata, but you still get lossless audio. I run my my Anthem, um, my processor, my preamp in uh, Dolby surround upmix mode. So if I ever play a rip, I'm getting lossless audio upmixed to uh, uh, 
immersively use the, the top speakers. Yeah, 2017 Shield still works, but it's a bit buggy. Um, yep, a lot of folks out there profess the Shield is the greatest thing ever. A number of other folks profess that they have problems with it. There's problems problems with every device though, but you will lose it, right? You'll lose Bitstream Atmos. You move from a Shield to an Apple TV, you have local rips that you wanna play. You're gonna lose Dolby Atmos. You're gonna lose DP, DTSX Bitstream output. It's just the way it is. I would love for it to change. Two things, probably if, if I could spur Apple to do them, one would be just juice the bit rates of iTunes movies and TV shows, right? Get us just bit stream or stream us lossless audio, stream us high bit rate video straight away from there. And then of course, let apps also output that bit stream lossless audio. Both of those would be, be amazing. You could almost argue that one Adding one would circumvent the other because the day that Apple decides to stream lossless audio and high bitrate video, my future content um, source has, has now been decided uh, forevermore. No need for anything else. Uh, can you consider doing a review for All Quiet on the Western Front on Netflix? The Atmos in that title is fantastic. Um, I'll check it out. I haven't seen that movie, uh, but I, at some point I probably will do another like, you know, check in on Netflix streaming bit rates. I can try to try to put that one in, in the list. Um, question in here, uh, Mr. Garcia, I have the old gen. Is it worth upgrading to this new one? Well, it depends how old you might have. If you have the 2021, uh, maybe you want to just keep using it for a while. Um, I'm an early adopter and, and for the price of these devices, 150 bucks to me is, is a pretty easy upgrade. Um, if you have anything older than the 2021, um, I would, I would be on apple.com right now. Go ahead and put that order in this new one so far for the week or so that I've been using it is looking pretty solid, pretty snappy, uh, pretty quick new features. If you have a Samsung TV, you want to try out that HDR 10, that would be a big reason to upgrade. So yeah, a couple comments here. Yeah, uh, from Jay. Yeah, I was looking for True HD. Yep. So can't do it on the Apple TV. So one one big gap. Um, up mixed with Oro. I haven't really. I haven't tried Oro yet. Anthem. Uh, Anthem doesn't support Oro. Question about the dynamic ranges. Able to set my 2021 Apple TV 4K to SDR or match content frame rate. 2022 won't let me do. Won't let me do SDR only HDR. Apple TV to Den AVR. That's wow. Most most people I would imagine have the opposite problem would be would be identifying bandwidth or whatever for HDR, but not being not being able to do SDR is kind of an interesting one. I would maybe try that HDMI uh, connection test that we ran a little bit ago. As we saw, it wasn't um, plugging this one in. Interestingly, it kind of wasn't automatically picking up those different different settings maybe give that a shot shot and see it and then then go back and verify you know set your settings and, and see if the sdr is selectable all right so metadata scan complete um so right why well, why infuse let's talk a little bit about why infuse so again i think the app is pretty fantastic i think the the fact that it goes around the apple ecosystem um is really fantastic. And if I am going to add a movie to my server, I sit down in my office on this computer, external Blu-ray drive, I can rip the disc, I can make the MKV, do all of that stuff. I can cop, name the file accordingly. I can move it, copy it to my server. I can put the poster on my computer. I fire up Infuse right here on my Mac, um, do the refresh, make sure that it, sc it scans correctly, put it into whatever playlist I want it into. And I'm done. And then I'm guaranteed that the next time I or anybody in the family comes down, you know, to the theater here and want, watches a movie and they watch them, they want to be able to easily access it with, you know, no downloads and all that stuff from Kaleidoscape side of thing, perhaps, but just it's there. It's ready to play. It's available to them. Infuse will have picked it up. It's already set. It's ready to go. So the, the Apple ecosystem piece, I think of Infuse is a big plus. Uh, it's fantastic. I think just in general, the way this app looks, the way this app operates, I find it historically to be a little more stable 
uh, than Plex can be. Um, Plex is arguably the more powerful thing. I think it's. I think in some ways, like Plex plus the shield and the 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 tweak ability and the customizability of of Android. That stuff kind of goes together in a certain way. Where Apple TV and Infuse, yeah, you don't maybe have as much customization power um, at your fingertips, but you have a little more simplicity. You have a little more reliability. You have a little more maybe elegance. And, and so those are things that I value more than the tweakability and the customizability of 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 things like Plex or you know an Android phone or a Google TV device uh, versus an Apple TV. So a couple of neat things that you can do in here, not to say that there is no customization. Infuse has actually quite quite a bit of customization starting with the home screen <clears throat> um, right here. So you're able to basically right edit this list. Uh, you can take off and uh, move and add to um, all kinds of different stuff. I often add, like if I wanted to say add movie genres as a selectable option on the screen, there it is. And if you wanted to like move things up and down, I tend to keep these in, in a very similar way. Recently added movies on top, movies, uh, the all movies list kind of underneath that. I like the top rated movies feature of Infuse. I think that's pretty cool. Oh, I prioritize. There we go. Little buggy. Little buggy. Come on, Infuse. Um, recently added movies. I'm just sitting here saying like how how much more reliable it is, and the UI is bugging out on me. There we go. <clears throat> Live demos, right? Um, top rated movies playlist, which I do use on Infuse. Movie genres, TV shows. And favorite, so you can put a whole plethora of things on your home screen, you know, whatever it is that kind of you want to see uh, with regards to your content um, and, and what's shown here. The settings themselves, there's quite a bit. Again, so we, we looked at this earlier. Uh, well, we looked at the library. Sorry, shares is where you can add your shares. So I've got my DS eighteen twenty one. We're here on my local network. It can see it. One of the other really cool things about Infuse is if you have media in a cloud storage, Dropbox, Google Drive, uh, OneDrive, et cetera, you can access those, index them, and play content from the cloud. It's it's pretty wild. For a while there, back before I, I migrated over to Kaleidoscape, and back when Google, um, like the G Suite, Google Business, actually allowed you to have an unlimited uh, amount of cloud storage for a relatively cheap amount of money per month um, on a business account, a lot of folks actually had very, very large repositories of ripped media uh, in the cloud. Can't do that anymore. They changed the policies and, and all that. But but Infuse could actually access dozens and dozens of terabytes of movie content from the Google Cloud. It was pretty, it was pretty sweet. Um, tracked, I don't actually use Tracked. Uh, we have a couple other settings here. App icon, uh, basically light or dark. I just go with the light one. Um, true black mode. Right. Do you kind of want your UI to be gray-ish um, with a little bit of color, you know, or do you want kind of black, black? I, I tend to just kind of stick to the grayish one. Um, file names versus like the metadata names of your movies. I prefer the metadata names. Sort order gives you a couple different options. Again, file names and so on. I like titles, alphabetical. File management off. I don't want anybody doing file management from the app itself. I don't want my kids or somebody accidentally deleting a movie changing something, whatever, I will do the file management um, on my computer from an administration perspective, that's fine. Um, show poster titles. So if we go into a, say like movie view, see all. So we can see that it kind of shows the titles underneath the movies, the title in the year versus the poster. Oops, I prefer um, actually not to have the title. So I turn this off. Metadata fetching on, of course, we do want that. None of my stuff has embedded metadata, don't use it. I don't actually like the up next list. So I'll turn that one off. Um, if, if you're inclined to watch part of something, or maybe you do a lot of TV show stuff, maybe you want the up next lift uh, up next list 
to at least just show that like watching only that one's not a bad setting but to me it's kind of redundant to have the up next list show recently added when there's a separate recently added uh row anyway watched indicators puts the little orange icon um or takes it off movies that you that you have watched it's on movies that you haven't watched yet Um, options to clear your metadata. So other things here, collections. I don't use the collections that it provides. I, I kind of treat playlists as my own, uh, my own collections. Um, I'm not, never been a fan of continuous playback. Um, I'll watch something and I will choose what I want to watch next. Thank you very much. Uh, resume playback. So if you watch part of something, and you stop it you come back to it another time later on it will ask you do you want to continue where you left off or start from the beginning kind of a normal apple tv ish app kind of thing to do uh, i like that and subtitles whoops not that one we're looking for no parental restrictions yet i'm getting close get the household is getting close to the point of maybe putting some parental restrictions on content uh, we'll see this is what I was looking for. Subtitles, forced only. Um, so quite a few options in here. Custom tailoring. If we go back, now we notice um, the titles are only shown on the one that I have selected, not um, every single one of them. The, the, watched, the watching list is now kind of uh, reduced a bit. I'm halfway into a bunch of these movies because I was doing some demo stuff down here. But if we go in, you know, I think Infuse has a pretty nice uh, metadata screen. Tells us the name of the movie. Tells us where the movie's from. It says they're on DS 1821. We can do some playlist management. We can rate it. If we had to, right, if Infuse missed, mismatched the piece of content, we would be able to change it to something else on the fly. Uh, attach this file to a, a, a different metadata source. And notice the keyboard, of course, now we have the grid keyboard. That's the view, that's the keyboard mechanism that I prefer for the Apple TV. If we go down here, or we can we can manage the watch state, right, on and off, clear the history. We get cast and crew metadata, um, and we get some other jump lists that take us kind of other places there on the bottom. So, yeah, this 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 is my favorite playlist. So again, I make these playlists. Um, putting putting stuff together. Um, I like how it gets uh, pictures right into the kind of the candy color icons for the playlist. But I, what I believe it's doing is it's grabbing like a backdrop from TMDB from the first movie in the playlist uh, functionally. So. Uh, one of the things that I like about playlists versus collections is you get a little more power in your organization. Collide Escape. I hope you're watching this part, right? Um, I can order things in my collection. I can just more customization. I can name them. Um, I can sort stuff. So Godzilla, for example, right? I've got all the Godzilla movies ripped in here. I've got them in chronological order. So some playlist I put in chronological order other playlists like G Kids, I put in alphabetical order, and I've got the power to do that with, you know, custom sorting um, in the in the playlists. Like that, I like that feature very much. Um, so quick jumps for genres, TV shows. If you wanted to see what, uh, I don't I don't rip a whole lot of TV show content. Actually, the stuff that I have in my TV show library is kind of these old eighty shows and 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 such that you can't uh, can't get all of them um on itunes and whatnot actually itunes is is underrepresented of 80s gi joe and transformers i wish they would fix that but if you want to see what the tv series interface looks like here we'll just go with gi joe so season one you know season numbering episode numbering i can go through the episodes and this is pulling i believe uh episode thumbnails also from tmdb not tvdb and I can jump through seasons. So here you go. Shows where uh, no studious person has decided to crowdsource uh, specific images, thumbnails for those um, TV show seasons. And then down on the bottom here, if you go into your library, you can really get 
into different um, like dynamic cuts, right, uh, of, of your stuff. I don't use this too much. Um, I do I do like a couple of the things that are in here though. For example, like release date. I like the decade uh, element of this, right? 1980s, child of the 80s. Um, being able to pull and, and cut kind of into your collection this way. So this is the kind of stuff I think that like Plex really does excel at is custom metadata and library management and spending a lot of time kind of administering and setting things up. Um, with Infuse, I didn't set any of this stuff up, right? You get these library views, you get these, um, right? it, it's pulling its metadata and, and all of that. Uh, it's what you get by default. The really only thing that you have to configure is the specific choice of metadata for a movie. You can customize the poster again by putting a poster next to your file and, and that's that. So similar, uh, similar kind of uh, options on the on the TV show thing or the TV show section uh, of the library. And then maybe just the last thing to show, right? The search, uh, oops, search is pretty good. It's on the fly as I type. Filtered search, I always prefer as I type, execute, right? Filter and execute the search as I type. I like how it differentiates, all right? Uh, movie results versus TV show results. And it also gives you episodes, cast and crew. So you do have the ability to uh, search by quite a um, couple different options uh, out of the metadata of your movie. And one of the other things, um, that I really, really like. I'm gonna have to pop off the UI here, but I do wanna show this uh, piece. So I've got Captain America, the Winter Soldier. This is the 4K disc rip. This movie has four subtitles in it. I was testing this. It's gonna take a minute to go playback. It's an HDR movie. Got a resync, 60 to 24. Let me get, there we go, back up in here. So this is what I like. Infuse puts the forced subtitles from the subtitle track in the picture image of a scope screen. People spend $14,000 on mad VR processors to deal with problems like this. And uh, I don't know about Plex. I don't know how Plex does it, quite honestly. Um, Maybe it does the same thing. Maybe Plex and its players have options for this uh, as well. But this is really important. Uh, if you're going to use a playback device in a dedicated theater space, you have an ultra wide, sc wide screen screen and you're zooming, right? You're zooming up um, in order to fill your screen with scope content. If uh, some other players, hardware players or software players by default, when they encounter a forced subtitle, may put them at the bottom bottom of the screen in the black bar space outside of the picture image, which is a problem if I hit my control four trigger here and I zoom this movie up, right? So it'll do the, the restore, the lens shift, all that kind of stuff. Oh, awesome. Oh, I got I to gotta pop this one. Uh, Chris Portal. Hey, Chris. Yep. Um, MathWorks Natick, fellow math worker, former boss. It was when I first started at MathWorks, he was my first boss. Love the channel. Like organized movies, extras. Yeah, yeah extras. Um, that, I think, is an area where Plex does a whole lot better than Infuse. Uh, honestly, I don't, I don't think Infuse gives you the ability to do much of anything with extras. So me personally, when I, when I have a piece of content, um, that I'm ripping, I, I, I never actually rip the extras. If I, if I consume the extras, I usually do it on iTunes. I feel like iTunes is one of the best services in terms of like actually providing extras and providing a really good quantity of them. And, um, 
in many cases, actually, iTunes uh, can often have like exclusive extras too that didn't make the disc. Or the other thing that you that you can see sometimes is uh, an iTunes entry of a movie may have extras from multiple past disc releases, physical releases, which is another another pretty cool thing. So I haven't tried to do extras um, in Infuse. If anybody knows, feel free to shout out, or I can I can take a look and and update because that infuses something and this whole kind of structure is something else I want to talk more about going forward. Um, but going to going back to this here, right? So again, now I've taken my projection, my, my projection on my screen. I've zoomed it up uh, as big as my throw distance allows me to fill. I need that JVC NZ9 would get me the little bit of extra to, to make that make that full screen fill. But if I had an inferior uh, playback hardware or uh, playback software that didn't either do the subtitles intelligently or didn't allow me to control where the subtitles went to, those subtitles would be off the screen right now. They, they could be down in the black space and I would have essentially just zoomed and masked them off. Uh, but by default, um, out of the box, just the way they coded the player, right? Infuse puts those subtitles in the movie image perfect awesome kaleidoscape does that as well they have a setting uh in their menu system of the strato player to basically say right always put the subtitles in the movie image perfect for this kind of a for kind of a setup so that that's one big plus alone uh, you know specifically for this software and this platform so i'm going to zoom back out here we're just going to go back to a regular 16 by 9 mode we'll head back out to the menus i'm not going to play any movie content i've got the audio muted definitely i don't don't need or want any uh youtube copyright takedowns and all that so still images uh still images only in the stream so we've been here a while covered quite a lot of stuff coming up on two hours i think we'll be we'll be close to calling it a night um, if anybody has some more qu uh, more questions, is there something else about the new Apple TV, about Apple TV in general, something that I can show, questions that I can answer, sound off? There will be more Apple TV content, um, of course, coming. Um, as I go forward in the channel now, and I do more of those like streaming face-off challenges, of course, I will be using this box. Um, there's one more. I think one more that I recorded uh, and have ready to publish. Yep, I did an Apple TV Plus streaming quality one. That one was already in the bag, done, edited, um, and all, all set to publish. I think that one will come out this coming or yeah, this coming Friday, or tomorrow, or yeah, Friday. Um, and then after that one, any future streaming face-off technical uh, measurements and stuff that I do will all be on the new box uh, going forward. And um, I, there's, a, there's more specifically that I wanna cover with regards to some video, audio, dedicated aspects, shorter form videos. Um, so stay tuned for that. Let's see, SF Day 56 says, worth upgrading 4K 64 gig gen three. Well, it depends, um, right? Is So you could probably sell that one for 60, 70 bucks on Facebook. So, you know, drop your used one off, buy the new one. Let's just say it cost you a hundred bucks. You know, how, how uh, if that's a, if that's a significant portion of your budget and a hundred dollars is steep for you, um, then maybe it's not worth it. If, uh, if it's not, you know, what are you getting? Well, you're getting uh, definitely a faster, more performant chip. And we'll see what Apple's is, is ready to do with that with future tvOS upgrades and updates and other things coming forward. If you've got a Samsung TV or a JVC uh, NZ, NZ uh, model projector, could be looking at you know taking advantage of HDR10 plus where you might not get uh, get Dolby Vision. Um, if you game on it, certainly go for it. Faster processor, more RAM, more storage. Um, I had had some issues with my even my 64 gig unit where Infuse would unload my metadata and it would have to like reparse if I launched the app. 
um, after not using it for a while. I hope to not see that happen with 128 gig of storage. So if you've got a big library, local stuff, you're using Infuse. There, there's definitely a few reasons why you might want to go uh, go with the new one. Um, yeah, if you just recently bought the 2021 and you could take it back, 50 bucks, you know, to get the to get the top model, I, I would I would do that in a heartbeat. I'll spend your money for you. I'm good at spending other people's money on technology. Um, Dylan asks, sorry, super late. You might have answered this. How fast does the new Apple TV switch between HDR and SDR? So pretty fast, I would say. But uh, well, that's more limited by your display um, than the Apple TV itself, basically. Um, I demoed that earlier here. I could do it again. But the problem is I'm down in my theater room right now, and I'm using a projector. I'm not in the living room with the LG, uh, the LG flat panel. So if I hit this and I say Apple TV go into 4K HDR, it's going to take a little bit. But this isn't the Apple TV's problem. It's the projector. There goes the color filter. The JVC has a, notorious, a notoriously long sync time, as well as the NZ7 model that I have uh, has an HDR or a... Uh, larger color space uh, color filter. It's on a mechanical sled. It basically moves in and out of the light path as you go in and out of SDR or HDR. So um, that's a demo of this setup specifically. It's not indicative of what you would get off a flat panel. Those kind of switches on the LG in the living room take like a second, borderline instantaneous. Again, I think some people are really excited about the QMS, the quick media switching use of VRR. So that nothing ever goes, oh, excuse me, nothing ever goes black to me. I'm used to projector sync times. So you're not going to get QMS VRR on a projector. The projectors don't even do VRR at all, um, even for games and stuff. And so, yeah, a second of a black screen, not a big deal. There's other features that they could spend their time on ahead of that. But sure, the, the capabilities there might as well uh Might as well do it. Um, yeah, so you know, he mentions as well here, right? He's on an Epson 5050 UB, nice projector. Yeah, going to be the same thing. It's, it's the limitation is the projector, not the Apple TV. And then if you've been able to hear or see any difference, audio or video differences with the new model. Um, so I've as of tonight, right now, uh, this recording, this live stream, I have now just gotten the Apple TV here in the theater ready to be used. So um, over the course of the last week, I've been using it in the living room and I've definitely noticed that it, it feels snappy. It feels quicker, playback, stop a playback, app launch, like just how fast this stuff is, right? Um, pulling stuff up like uh, movie walls, scrolling, the speed, like you don't even know, like infuse, boom, just you're not even waiting for posters, right? Posters to pop in. I've noticed stuff like that I guess more than any um, specific audio or video, like kind of quality difference. Um, but I also haven't in the last week. I could I'd say too. I haven't really watched that much. I think my wife and I we might have watched an episode of Cobra Kai. Uh, we're two episodes away from finishing the series. Probably would have been able to do that tonight if not not for this live stream. Um, so we've done that, and then. I've had some YouTube TV on in the background and of all the things that I could play, uh, you know, worrying about audio and video quality streaming cable is not the measuring stick uh, for that by any means, especially when particularly this week, I've only really just thrown it on to put, um, put news on watching all of the, uh, the election stuff. All right, a couple more questions. If you've got them, fire them out. We're going to wrap up here pretty soon. Uh, did you spray paint your grills upstairs yet? Um, yep, light passes is the key three or four times. Yep, no, I haven't. I just haven't done it. Actually, I had a really interesting conversation this week um, with another, what could be a very sweet partner for the channel um, and somebody that I know kind of in the home theater business or have known that's really gotten established in the home theater business over the last year. Um, and it's got me thinking about actually quite a few things to, uh, to do where that could go on in the living room. Um, uh, 
possibly even involving like rebuilding the bump out a little bit, uh, tearing down the drywall and getting that, that living room set up to be a little more modular because if things go the way they could go, um, I may have facility to get my hands on a variety of, of speaker brands um, and models uh, and be able to try a variety of, of in walls and stuff coming up um, in the living room. But I've got to be able to install them in a modular way. So anyway, we'll get to that in the future. But long story short, um, I haven't painted those speakers yet. Even the ones in the theater right behind me. There it is, right? Still white. Um, yeah, it just hasn't been a priority. I don't know. In this room, I still got the white trim. Um, I kind of, I kind of like the white, and in the living room as well, it hasn't, it, it doesn't, it doesn't bug me. And I don't think my wife once has said like, "Oh, you really got to paint those." So I don't think the white is bugging her, uh, bugging her either. So we'll we'll see what happens. Um, see what happens there. So like the ending by the way cobra kai yeah we got two more i think the thing they did in third to last episode um spoiler alert with the idea of this like global karate tournament finally gave the show a reason i think up until the, the go, going into the end game of these final episodes of the last season it's like you know th these these power guys at play here are really fighting over something really arbitrary like why do they need all of these karate kid this karate kid army and all of that but now it, it I, I think it actually makes it gives them some real motive <laughs> real sensible motivation that shows pretty wild but child of the 80s so yeah all the nostalgia to the original karate kid gets me pretty good um so like the bump out may do the same i thought that was a pretty cool idea um andrew robinson on his channel did it i can say i did mine first <laughs> um but yeah, if you can frame in, you're doing a living room, you want to accommodate, you know, some really nice integrated but high end uh, kind of stuff, doing the pillar based TV inset surround, you know, kind of kind of thing framed in finished drywall trimmed out. I think that's a really, really great way to go. Um, and you, you might even find that your your spousal acceptance factor um, might be higher and, and give you some more facility to do some more things with av in your living room than uh than you otherwise might be able to so i just got my mac battery uh error popping up so i think we're literally here in the last minute or so i got one more question every day jay do you have a suggestion for a low profile gpu um low profile gpu gt 1030 struggling with high bit rate for yeah so you're using a home theater pc yeah i don't know honestly um Sorry on that one. I haven't, uh, the last, the, the last year's few years worth of, uh, PC building that I've done, um, has completely allowed me to issue any ideas of worrying about size or noise or anything like that. And I've been building in, you know, larger mid tower cases, 3090 TI, 4090, whatever, full-size GPUs. I haven't even had to bother uh, worrying about size or constraints because I've got my PC in the big old storage room sitting up on top of my rack uh, in a closed door room away. It doesn't matter how loud or how fast or loud the fans spin. doesn't matter how big and obtrusive it, it is. Um, so I don't have a good suggestion for that. Sorry. All right. I think we will call it um, hopefully a fun uh, and useful live stream. I really like the idea of doing these streams more regular, but basing them like around a topic. Coming up though, I think I will end up having um, some really cool guests coming on with me as well. Um, but um, I, I like the idea of, of just kind of hanging out, putting, putting some longer form time in, trying to keep the videos a little more focused and shorter but then really just having the ability to, to break into topics deeper. And I've got more ideas for, for more live streams coming up. If people would like to get into, you know, elements of automation and that in the theater, we can, we can break that down in a live stream. People want to see Kaleidoscape, you know, in a, in a more operational hands-on Q and a kind of detail, like we did with the Apple TV tonight. I can do that. Um, as I mentioned, I'll tease it out again. I had just a really awesome conversation this week. I am super excited for stuff coming to the channel. I'm talking to a handful of folks around the Michigan area for tours. Stay tuned next week. 
um, coming. I've got my first uh, home theater tour. That's not my room or not my spaces uh, and hoping to do a live stream around that one. So yeah, we'll call it here. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, please do all the regular YouTube stuff. Hit those likes and, and, and that on the way out. Leave some, leave some comments on the videos. If you'd like to support the channel, a whole bunch of ways to do that. Use those Amazon affiliate links, YouTube memberships, cool merch in the spread shop, um, and more. If you're thinking about a Kaleidoscape, I've got the referral code down there um, as well. Thanks so much for watching, and come on back for more home theater discussion and fun.